Thank you. Um, it's a natural theme for me to talk about today, actually, uh, generosity, greed, and the greater good, because I think those intersect with the world of banking and finance in many different levels. Um, and today, what I'd like to do is I'd like to present on how um, the world is changing in finance for the greater good as a result of the greed of uh, the financial crisis. Um, so uh, to give you a little bit of background, it was uh, 2006 that I left my well-paid career in investment banking. Um, and I like to think it was something to do with um, the theme of generosity, greed, and the greater good. Um, I discovered three things about a bank, which I wrote a book on and um, have been presenting on for an awful long time. And three things that people don't know about a bank that cause a lot of the troubles that we're experiencing today and have experienced is that firstly, when you deposit your money with a bank, the bank actually becomes the legal owner of your money. And that's one of the, one of the, the driving forces of where we are today. The second thing is that when the bank becomes the legal owner of your money, they actually spend it as they wish. Um, and they tend to issue loans for things that you probably would never, ever think about um, issuing loans for. And the third thing about banking is that banks actually have the ability to create money. So 97% of every penny in our economy has actually been created by this private institution called a bank. And because of those three forces, banks actually get to direct 97% of every penny in our economy, which is why they direct governments and policy, because they're by far the greatest and most influential institution out there. And these three forces um, left me to leave my job in 2006 and work on the world of alternative finance. And so what I'm going to do for you in the, in the next few minutes that I've got is I'd like to share with you um, the world of finance yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Um, and I'd like to do it by exploring the journey of a business um, seeking funding. And here's how it used to look um, yesterday. Essentially, one of the biggest shifts that we've had over the last few years, if you imagine this diagram, um, is that we've had a shift in the cost of business. It used to cost an awful lot of money for trucks, factories, and phone bills, and infrastructure, and networks in order to start a business. So uh, the average business used to need approximately 100,000 pounds upwards to millions in order to get started. But what happened over the last few years is we've seen a shift. And that shift is essentially Silicon Valley has been paying the bills for us to start businesses on a shoestring. Now the startup cost has moved to an internet connection, a laptop, and a smartphone. And we all have global distribution networks through Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and all these other tools, which has shrunk the cost of business. It's why not so long ago in the UK we used to have 600,000 businesses. Now we've got 5 million of them. Uh, because the cost has shrunk. But once you got that, there was that, you know, it used to be that you needed to either save an awful lot of money to get started in business, or you needed to risk your family's money. It's called Triple F. Friends, founders, and family money was how businesses were started. Which is okay if your family's wealthy, but if your family wasn't wealthy, you needed to persuade your mom and dad to stick their life savings on your, on your whim in business, which often doesn't work and causes a lot of challenges in the family when it doesn't work. And then if you got through that phase where essentially you managed to get the money together to get started, you then used to have to go to this, this, this institution that used to lend to businesses. You may have heard of them. They used to be called banks. And what they used to do is they, used to, they were actually around in order to help people get access to capital in order to start a business. Now what they do is essentially almost 80% of every penny in a bank is used for inflating property prices by making loans on property, which is why, why property is unaffordable. The only reason that property prices go up is simply because it's banks' favorite asset to lend against. Because if you default on the loan, they can repossess the property. And the rest is for consumer loans, because it's secured against your job. But when it comes to a business, there's no way of actually them wanting to lend to that, because you have this law called limited liability, and you can walk away, and it's risky. So they stop lending, and essentially there's only two types of bank lending at the moment, the ones that the government forcing them to do, and the ones that the PR um, firm has said, let's get some positive PR in our load of negativity.
But then, if you managed to persuade the bank to lend you money, you then had to go and find rich people to invest. If you think about it, the average angel investment is called, these wealthy people that invest in businesses, used to be approximately £100,000. And if it was £100,000 to invest in a business, this is a risky investment. So it would need to be a pool of 10 investments to find one that worked really well, which would mean they'd need to invest about a million. And remember, in general, from their whole portfolio, this would be the high risk, high, um, high return part of their portfolio. So it would only be 10% of it. So they need about 10 million pounds in order to be an angel investor. So we used to have to just go and find rich people to invest, which is okay if you were like me and you worked in investment banking and you knew people like that. But for others, it was an extremely challenging, extremely daunting task. But what used to happen in the old world is that once you got the bank loan and once you got the wealthy investor, it used to open up this form of institutional money. And institutional money is essentially the institutions that we're paying our pension to every month are pooling that money together and a percentage of it is being invested by fund managers around the city and they have access to billions and billions and billions. And so the only difference between the burger bar and McDonald's was that McDonald's figured out a way of packaging their business where they could access finance from financial institutions and then go and expand and grow. The burger bar just simply stuck at the friends, founders and family round or, didn't get, or just got to the bank loan. And these venture capitalists would then invest you know, a few million in a business. Um, and then we had access to very good financial markets in the UK. So we had private equity where institutions would invest 25, 100 million in businesses. Um, and then you could take your company public on one of our stock markets and raise hundreds of millions or borrow the money from a financial market. And that's the journey that a big McDonald's went through compared to the burger bar which stuck at the beginning. And it was access to finance that made the difference between the large corporates that you see today because they managed to get on this curve to serving their business. Now the challenge was, is that it was the hardest finance you will ever raise was your first 10,000 pounds, 50,000 pounds, 100,000 pounds. Raising 10 million and billions through a public offering is a lot easier than raising 10,000 pounds for a new idea. Um, it's a lot easier to do that. So when the financial crisis came along and all these markets started seizing up, Entrepreneurs set about making changes. The government didn't make any change. We had some top-down um, changes that were needed. Firstly, we needed to stop these unfairness of banking, and instead we chose to bail them out and continue the system. Um, and instead, entrepreneurs came along and created some bottom-up changes. They created businesses to serve and change the financial sector. So today, this is the world we now live in. Today, the cost of starting your business has shrunk to an internet connection, a laptop, and a smartphone. Things that most people already have in a country like ours. And if you get that internet connection, that laptop, and a smartphone, it gives you the ability to record a video and stick it on YouTube and get distribution and stick it on a website called crowdfunding. If you haven't heard of crowdfunding, crowdfunding was originally created by the movie industry. The movie industry found it incredibly challenging in order to raise finance. The reason it was so hard is because there's a chicken and egg scenario in the movie industry. The chicken and egg scenario is that no famous actor wants to be a part of your film unless you have the finance in place. And no financier would finance your film unless you had the famous actor in place. And it was always a, a change, strange scenario. So the movie industry said, well, what can we do? What are we good at? Well, we're good at getting a team of people together and creating a trailer. And so they took these trailers and said, and put them on platforms called crowdfunding platforms and said, here's the movie we would love to create. If you give us a tenner, we'll give you a digital download copy of the movie now that distribution is accessible to all. And if you give us 50 quid, we'll feature you in the credits of the movie and give you a digital download. And you give, if you give us a thousand, we'll make you the non-executive producer of the movie. <laughs> and so we went, it, it, this, and then businesses came along and said, hold on, that's an interesting concept. And so businesses realized, what if we could create an idea, pitch it on a video, create a trailer for what we want to create, and people could decide and pre-order that product 
before it actually got created. Pebbles Watch is a very interesting example. Pebbles Watch went to all the venture capitalists, all the rich people, and no one would invest. They invented a watch that speaks to your phone and created one of the first wearable technologies. And they said, in, we need £100,000 in order to create this. Here's our team. They put it on a website called Kickstarter and said, here's the watch that we want to create. Here's our prototype. We're going to sell it for $200. If you give us $150 now, then you can have one in nine months' time once we've created it. And after 65 odd thousand orders, they had to close the crowdfund because they were scared that they did not know how to deliver $10.3 million worth of watches. And that was a, you know, the one that got turned down from all the traditional sources of finance. That sparked a massive shift. This is called rewards-based crowdfunding, and you've heard of companies like Kickstarter and Indiegogo that do this extremely well. Then came along um, companies like Bank to the Future, which is the one that I'm a part of, and said, could we lobby the government to change the rules? Prior to this, it was punishable by a seven-year prison sentence to go and pitch your business to somebody that wasn't rich and didn't sign the correct certificates. And we managed to persuade HMRC, the Bank of England, the regulators, to completely change rules over a two to three year period. And the UK pioneered and became the first and inventor of a product called equity crowdfunding. The, com the, the concept was simple. What if everybody could be an investor? What if we could democratize investing? What if you could invest from as little as 10 pounds and get shares in companies and do the same thing that the angel investors and venture capitalists have been doing all along? And that's what equity crowdfunding came along and did. And it started raising millions for businesses, offering shares to their fans and ordinary people, everyday people that just want to invest and get a, a slice of what they like. If you think of the internet, the internet is lots of segments of people that congregate around tribes. TEDx is a tribe. It's a tribe of people that are committed to learning more, being more, doing more, and understanding the cutting edge. And so crowdfunding, what it does is it makes your tribe through LinkedIn groups, through Facebook groups, become your funders and your backers. And the likelihood of your business succeeding when you have those as your shareholders, we believe massively increases. It's too early to tell the story yet of where this is actually going. But equity crowdfunding said, let's democratize investing for all. And then came, so we, uh, just as to, to let you know, Bank to the Future, this is slightly old, we raised three quarters of a million pounds through the crowd and all of our investors are people that dig the mission of reforming banking, reforming, making changes in the world of finance. And they all became our investors and backers and invested and have shares in our company. Then came along, well, no, all these people are sat there with deposits in banks that's been bailed out and uh, they're not earning any money on their interest. What if they could actually lend direct to businesses and receive a much higher return by actually lending to businesses direct and cutting the bank out of the middle. And crowd lending, peer-to-peer -peer lending came along, invented in the UK again, and said, there's loads of people with money, we'll pay them an interest on their money, and they lend direct to businesses without the guarantee or the unsustainable bank guarantee that sits in the middle. And they get a higher return because they assume some of the risk, but they diversify across lots of different loans. And now you can get 8 to 15% return on your money by investing it direct and cutting out all the financial institutions in the money um, in from the middle. And essentially, that's the world we live now. So one of the companies that raised finance through our platform said, what if we could do that for mortgages? What if we could take, if you could actually raise finance by getting hundreds of people to invest in property. All the students and the first time buyers have been crowded out of the market. What if we could crowd them back in by allowing them to get on the property ladder, starting from as little as 10 pounds, 100 pounds, and building a portfolio of hundreds of properties with a few thousand pounds, and diversified across lots of different properties and cut the bank out of the middle, and all the returns that the banks get go direct to the people. And that's exactly what's being invented and launched right now. And then you can access the big financial market. So for the first time in history, 
we now have a very well, very well defined process for raising that less than one million pounds. You can now get started with an internet connection, a laptop and a smartphone. You can now take your idea and offer people rewards without having to pitch investors and promise returns. You can now then, once you're further along, take that business and raise further capital from everyday investors rather than just rich people, opening up the market. And you can now earn returns on your money by lending direct without the financial institution in the middle. But the challenge is, what's the difference between this and the old picture? That this is where the greater good part of the theme actually comes in. When you take this to where it's going to be, and we're growing at about 300% in some products, equity crowdfunding is growing at about 600% per annum at the same time as bank lending to businesses shrinking at 8% per annum. I forecasted by 2015 the crowd finance market will be bigger than the bank lending market by 2015 to SMEs. And not only that, but the democratization factor, the financial inclusion that can be achieved from this is where the greater good. Now, here's the thing. When you have a financial institution like a bank in the middle, they fund things that you don't know you're funding with your money. But with crowd finance, what gets funded reflects the values of society. Once this goes where it's meant to go, now people are deciding what gets funded rather than the profits and the institutions of banks. This is a big force for good. And I'd like to end on one more force for good, which is often portrayed as a force for bad at the moment. And it's, you may have heard of a digital currency called Bitcoin. The problem with all these different in, um, things here is that they rely upon working with a financial institution and a bank. And an invention happened in 2008 by a gentleman called Satoshi Nakamoto. And Satoshi Nakamoto, very peed off with the financial crisis, invented an, 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 an experiment and did a white paper about how you could actually reinvent the financial system so that you don't need a financial institution. They invented several things. Firstly, they invented a completely transparent ledger. Think about a bank as a ledger saying, Mrs. Jones has 10,000 pounds, Mr. Jones has 8,000 pounds, and it's a ledger that relies on the financial institution, but you don't know that that ledger is not transparent and helps in, in countries like Cyprus, you have confiscation of your bank deposits. Um, and then think of a central bank as a ledger for the banks. They say HSBC has this amount of money. Well, what Satoshi Nakamoto invented is an open source, transparent ledger that anyone can download on their computer. And they also invented a verification system where you could lend your computer to verify transactions in a trustless environment where you no longer needed to trust the bank. And they also invented a way for, back, for actually people to create money. So if you look at the history on the final, my, my final point, if you look at the history, it was originally kings and governments that were needed to create money. Then when, when banks became larger, they, the government outsourced the ability to create money to banks, and now 97% of money is created by a bank. But now for the first time, people can create the money, and it's decentralized across lots of different people. So here's my final thought of this slide. That actually, Bitcoin, the currency, is the first experiment of this decentralized technology. The next experiment is decentralized crowdfunding, decentralized loans that don't require trust, where you can add property as collateral to the network, decentralized public offerings, decentralized venture capital, decentralized loans, decentralized everything. So for the first time in history, when you combine crowdfunding with decentralized currencies, you have the people deciding what gets funded. You have the ultimate tour de good, tour de force for good. And that is that now you are the bank, you're the venture capitalist, you're the angel investor, you're the investment bank, you're the central bank. They've now had their time, the people want something else. And I believe when the people decide what gets funded, it will finally, for the first time, reflect the values of society what actually gets funded, because I don't think people will crowdfund weapons of mass destruction.